I just told the commissioner that um, his wife is excused. Apparently, she's visiting a new grandbaby, so she gets to be excused, right? But I figure we've got the next best thing to his wife introducing him in the form of a video from our Mayor Lori Lightfoot. So if you guys could, wait, you guys said you're going to start. I don't have to click, right? Okay. Hello, everyone. And in case you forgot, I'm Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot. And today, I have the great pleasure of introducing you to Maurice Cox, Commissioner of the Chicago Department of Planning and Development. Commissioner Cox is a man of many hats. He's an architect, an urban planner, professor, father, husband, and at one point, he was a mayor. And of course, an equitable champion of development. Prior to serving our city through DPD, Commissioner Cox held a similar role in the city of Detroit, as well as positions at the National Endowment for the Arts, the University of Virginia, Syracuse University, Harvard University, and as mayor of the city of Charlottesville, Virginia. He served there as a city councilman for six years before serving as mayor for two years. Commissioner Cox has also worked on all kinds of groundbreaking architectural and urban planning projects. And so we are fortunate that he has chosen to bring his energy, talent, and visionary leadership here to Chicago. During my administration, Commissioner Cox has helped reimagine and transform Chicago's development strategies in a way that spurs economic development and fosters inclusive growth. He has also been integral to the early and continued success of our Invest Southwest Signature Neighborhood Economic Development Investment Strategy and oversaw the drafting of our We Will Chicago citywide plan. This one-of-a-kind plan, the first since 1966, is being heard by the Plan Commission later this month and will serve as a formal roadmap for equity and resiliency in our city. I am personally deeply grateful for Commissioner Cox's leadership and collaboration, and I'm excited for him to share his vision for Chicago with all of you today. So with no further ado, please give a warm and hearty City Club welcome to Commissioner Maurice Cox. Excellent. All right, so good afternoon. And uh, thank you all, thank you all for coming out. Uh, it's nice to be in person, isn't it? You know, in this beautiful, beautiful crowded room, everyone fully vaxxed and triple boosted, um, I hope, and, um, and coming out for uh, your not so new anymore uh, planning commissioner um, to hear what I have to say about this wonderful city. Um, I think it's uh, better late than never, uh, and I'm thrilled to, to meet your acquaintances. Um, you know, it feels fresh. You know, I put on a tie for you. Uh, and, uh, you know, it feels a little bit like a formal coming out to the uh, Chicago business community, um, even though I've been here for three and a half years. So I'm honored uh, to share uh, this moment with you. Uh, and uh, as you can see from the title of this talk, we have a lot to talk about. Can I do the honor? So um, I just want to start by thanking uh, Mayor Lightfoot um, for what has been an amazing uh, journey thus far. Uh, and as so many of you know, uh, Mayor Lightfoot found me in Detroit, where I was planning director overseeing one of the most uh, inclusive and unlikely city comeback stories in American history. One that has finally begun to reverse uh, the historic exodus out of Detroit, where for the first time in 50 years, uh, Detroit is poised to grow again. So I was humbled um, that this true reformer appointed me, uh, an architect and an outsider, uh, to Chicago's commissioner, uh, to be com the commissioner of planning and development. Uh, I had never heard really a mayor speak so clearly about equity and about reversing decades of urban disinvestment the way our mayor 
has. So for the very first press conference announcing Invest Southwest, I was inspired to make her words visible to Chicagoans, uh, and particularly residents of the South and West Side, uh, and show them in bricks and mortar what equity and resiliency looks like. So I thank Mayor Lightfoot for tr trusting me with uh, so many of her signature initiatives, a few of which I'll talk uh, about today, namely Invest Southwest, the Come Home Project, the Central Area, and her vision for one Chicago, the We Will Chicago citywide plan. I also want to start um, by acknowledging all of the people who uh, either recruited me here uh, or have been really a beacon of inspiration since I arrived. Here uh, in one photo, you have the City Hall's trifecta of planning, economic development, and housing. I'm with my partner in city building, uh, Housing Commissioner Marissa Navarra, uh, and uh, who, a uh, force of nature, our <laughs> Deputy Mayor Samir Mayakar. So this photo uh, captures a, a truly memorable moment for us, uh, celebrating the groundbreaking of a new $38 million mixed-use project in Auburn Gresham in late August of last year. But it is um, teamwork that makes the dream work. Uh, this is just a part of my dream team that's making our work possible with vision, resolve, uh, innovation. They are here. Uh, could you please stand? I want folks to see you in receive a round of applause for DPD in the house. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. So um, a little bit about my journey to Chicago. Uh, for the record, I am not actually from Detroit. Detroit uh, certainly gave me the, the biggest challenge of my career, but I think it's Chicago that has given me the opportunity of a lifetime. My story starts actually in New York City, followed by years working and living in Florence, Italy, Charlottesville, Virginia, Washington, DC, New Orleans, Detroit, and finally here in Chicago. I grew up in Brooklyn where both my parents uh, had immigrated from the Bahamas as children. Uh, it's also where they would go on to raise uh, nine children. I'm the youngest. And my parents sent every one of us to college to pursue the American dream, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Growing up in our section of Brooklyn, we witnessed firsthand what we now know as block busting, uh, as black families um, like ours arrived on our street. White families were advised by realtors to get out uh, while they could. So families sold low and we bought high and the white flight began. During the 20 years plus um, that we owned our home, I watched a socially and economically vibrant community fall into disrepair and disinvestment. I, for the life of me, couldn't figure out why this was happening. Despite a community's love and best efforts, nothing could save the grocery store or the department store or the other businesses that closed and became a blight in the neighborhood. I mean, fortunately, our little block remained intact, but it was uh, like a lifeboat in a sea of despair. I attended a magnet school uh, in Midtown Manhattan where uh, I took the train uh, every day. My mornings were like going to the, the Emerald City uh, but I'd return home every afternoon to see more demolition and disinvestment. It may be hard to imagine, but as a 14-year-old, I committed myself to doing something about it. Uh, and I decided to become an architect, thinking that would solve it. 
I was going to find a way to bridge the divide between neighborhoods like mine and the shining downtown on the horizon. I'm sure the same dream occurs to many black and brown teenagers right here in Chicago who see the disparities between the loop and the south and west sides. So upon my arrival in Chicago, I understood that I had a lot to learn and I need to learn it quickly. Chicago has always been a city of neighborhoods. So I had to get out and immerse myself in the community and meet the residents that I would serve. I also started touring the city. I toured virtually every square mile of the city and every, within every ward with every alderman. And often I would see uh, north side and south side and west side wards all in the same day, which clearly exposed the inequities that Chicagoans have been trying to deal with for decades the wealth gaps, the life expectancy gaps, the transportation gaps, the shopping and amenity gaps. There was a fundamental neighborhood gap going on here in Chicago. Um, <clears throat> so those were two uh, north side streets. Um, you almost never see those streets uh, on the south and west side. But <clears throat> You also see streets and scenes like this one. This is East Garfield, where there are beautiful homes, tree-lined streets, and well-maintained homes occupied by people of color. You also, this is North Lawndale. What amazing, amazing neighborhoods exist throughout this city. But the commercial corridors are a completely different story. You turn the corner and you find streets that look like this with boarded up storefronts, low level retail shops, vacant lots everywhere and very few jobs and hardly any place for families and ch uh, with children and couples to enjoy kind of local culture. I found myself questioning how more than half of the city's geography could lack the seemingly endless amenities that made Northside commercial corridors so special and convenient. I think this map uh, illustrates the disinvestment that informed my first impression, uh, and it shows how many of the same issues that impacted my neighborhood in Brooklyn were at work here uh, in Chicago as well. So the idea um, is to go to scale. There are scales of opportunity, um, small, medium, and large. Um, but in order to address that, um, we have to have a reckoning with the history of how we got here. Right? This is a complex um, history that begins with uh, redlining, encircling entire geographies. This is on the south side with a red line and denying those areas access to loans or home, mortgaging, uh, home mortgages. Um, and if you were adjacent to a red line, you were also penalized. And so what happened is urban disrepair, urban blight emerged, but it was systemic. Um, you see here an official map that determines what can be saved, what can be improved, and then what must go. And you can see enormous swaths of black where systematically, the neighborhoods were dismantled. And these neighborhoods had vibrant commercial corridors that looked like this. But you can read that, um, that notice where the shop owner is selling everything because they've been slated for demolition. 
But what we were demolishing were the core, the hearts, the downtowns of neighborhoods. This is the center of Inglewood. So churches, theaters, mercantile shops, all blighted, supposedly, not really. And with that same momentum, a focus on bringing the middle class back to downtown. This hyper focus led by corporate leaders, led by our, our politicians to concentrate development in the city's core to attract back uh, the middle class. And what it led to was a historic divide between rich and poor uh, neighborhoods, the middle class being pushed out, the concentration of wealth existing in the north and along the lakefront. This is the history of how we got here. But I would say that this map illustrates disinvestment, but that same map and how it was created, uh, we can dismantle it and we can try a different approach. So um, I like to talk about cities as having a, a heart and a soul. The downtowns are the heart and they belong to everyone and the neighborhoods are the soul. And Chicago has 77 of those souls. So if you fast forward, to 2019 and the mayor uh, announcing a transformational investment of $750 million of public investment in 10 uh, neighborhoods on the south and west side. She correctly said, stated that we can change public policy. We can use public investment to catalyze private investment. And that's why she's been so relentless in talking about uh, these underappreciated and disinvested communities. Um, Invest Southwest was um, a, based on uh, a community engagement strategy um, in the hopes and the dreams of hundreds of thousands of residents who stayed and continue to live, work, and raise families uh, on the south side. The people who stayed, despite uh, more than 50 years of disinvestment that drove many of the middle class in, uh, neighborhoods into poverty, um, we are doing this for this generation. But how do you begin to restore the soul of a city? As I learned from my time in Charlottesville and New Orleans and Detroit, you can't be everything, everywhere, and all at once. Um, one single family house at a time is too small. One neighborhood at a time is still um, too small. So for Invest Southwest, we decided to work on 10 community areas simultaneously, each with similar characteristics that make them middle neighborhoods. So middle neighborhoods are neither healthy and thriving, nor are they overtly distressed. They're in the middle. So we invited members of each of the 10 communities into the planning and design process so they could co-author what their neighborhoods were becoming. Community members targeted 12 key commercial corridors and multiple opportunity sites for the first phases of public and private investment, places that had long defined these neighborhoods' front doors, their iconic institutions, where residents convened for shopping, nightlife and other activities that foster community cohesion and togetherness and a sense of belonging, where we would reestablish the concept of the 15 minute neighborhood, where all your basic needs are just a short walk away from your home. 
And how we would do that, how, how do you encourage economic development in neighborhoods that the private market has avoided for half a century? Well, you share compelling visions of what's um, supported by residents. You highlight the neighborhood's assets and their amazing buying power. And you assemble a menu of public resources that make private investment possible. Through residents' input, we issued 13 requests for proposals in over the following two years, each targeting a historic building, a historic block, uh, or a key intersection. Um, these sites included uh, a mix of public and private properties that could serve as anchors for future growth. The developers responded in an overwhelming manner, more than $450 million proposed uh, in project, total project costs. Today, there's a transformation underway that's reversing the status quo with innovation uh, in neighborhoods and with uh, workforce development. We created a pipeline. The initial $750 million today has become $2.2 billion in public and private commitments. This is how the Lightfoot administration plans to save neighborhoods, by repurposing, by reinventing, by reusing what is already there, including the streets, the sidewalks, and the buildings themselves. And that's very different than we have historically seen in Chicago, where urban renewal and mega projects have become the norm, uh, where entire neighborhoods are planned on vacant land while we have existing roads and streets uh, in transit that we could build from. Over, um, and uh, one of the early goals of Invest Southwest was to infuse equity into all of our criteria for evaluating who should build the community's vision for the South and West Side. Our hope was to provide homegrown talent, especially emerging black and brown entrepreneurs who could enhance their skills and capacity to undertake transformative development projects that rebuild neighborhoods from within. And that's what's moving forward throughout the West and South Side. As I mentioned, over $450 million of investment and what it looks like, and who is doing the investment. There is a new generation of developers of color that are building this vision. You have the um, Healthy Hub, this beautiful uh, mercantile building that was saved and repurposed, repurposed um, by the Auburn Gresham CDC. You have 43 in green the first 10 story um, mixed income, mixed use building um, next to the L in Bronzeville. You have Thrive Inglewood, another mixed use development by DL3 um, in uh, Inglewood. You have the AV in Humble Park, another mixed use de uh, development by um, KMW and POA. You have the Auburn Gresham Apartments with um, Evergreen Imagine, and Tory Barrett, and David Block. You have Inglewood Connect with McLaurin Partnerships and um, Farpoint the restoration of a historic uh, firehouse. You have United Yards uh, with Celadon Partners and Jose Duarte um, in back of the yards. And Pioneer Bank um, with the team Pioneros again. Um, these are extraordinary catalytic projects that signal that these communities 
can grow again. And of course, um, a project we will be breaking ground on <laughs> in uh, uh, Ogden, on, on Ogden and Roosevelt, um, the um, development with uh, related um, and, five, and 548 development. But it's also uh, the private sector that have responded to the mayor's call with an unprecedented um, manner, creating jobs, uh, jobs that are embedded in community, like the terminal in Austin or uh, in Chatham, uh, the Discover. Hundreds of jobs with people can access um, and work where they live. In Northwestern, a uh, $100 million investment uh, in Bronzeville. Uh, and just yesterday, we broke ground on the, the Regal Mile Cinema campus um, in South Shore, another $100 million investment. Um, so it's an extraordinary response. These are places that no one thought to look for opportunity. So they are large, uh, large projects that are catalytic. But we also found that um, the question we raised was, how could we be more inclusive? How could we assist emerging developers who um, still find there to be barriers? So we scrutinize our, our process, um, the time, the costs, the resources available, and we are moving towards another system um, of inclusion, the RFQ. So yes, any developer uh, can submit a response, but could emerging developers of color really compete given the time, money, and effort uh, that was involved? We pivoted. The difference is that an RFQ simply asks the developer to submit their qualifications for examples of their work, um, we, the, we would assess the neighborhood impact, resiliency, equity, um, and then we would lower the barrier of entry by forging a partnership with the Chicago Community Trust that would provide $25,000 stipends to cover the pre-development costs for each team. And all of these change, changes have helped to remove the remaining barriers and circumstance that stymied emerging black and brown developers from participating. We just tested this new model um, in, Garf in East Garfield Park and Woodlawn. And I have to say from the results you see here, the approach appears to be working. Not only are they extraordinary designs, um, but they are equitable teams, inclusive partnerships, as well as beautiful buildings. And so we continue to use this process and we're using it in Roseland and we're using it in uh, West Garfield Park. This process is still underway. Um, these are still uh, the six proposals that the community will be evaluating through surveys and meetings and we hope to announce the winner uh, in March. But then there's the medium scale, right? Uh, and the question about where do you go with this corridor strategy? How do you grow the West and South sides in ways that are inclusive without displacement? And I say very incrementally. Um, and let's be kind of realistic here, 10, 10 neighborhoods lost hundreds of thousands of residents since the 1950s. And so as we move from a strategy of demolition to one of preservation and construction, you have to continue to prioritize residents who are already there and those who want to return. So for these families and others, we've created a second act for Invest Southwest that will be unveiled in 2020, 2023. Um, 
It involves um, a suite of projects that aspire to do strategic infill um, that fills out the corridors and addresses the vacant lots. These are small and medium-sized projects that are designed to promote um, corner block development. This is called Ready Build. Uh, and Ready Build creates custom plans with mixed use structures that have retail spaces on the ground floor uh, and residents above. It um, is meant to address the middle developer um, who could uh, grow into the larger projects. And you can see how these smaller scale buildings, one retail establishment on a corner with uh, eight to 16 units above. But there's also the small scale filling in the storefronts uh, of existing um, commercial streets. Um, this is old fashioned donuts. Some of you may know. This is an example of the mayor's Chicago recovery plan dollars being exported to the far south side. Um, these grants, they range from $30,000 to $250,000. Uh, and they can go as high as $5 million. There are more than $120 million in grants going to dozens and dozens of establishments like this um, throughout the city. So this was a 560,000 grant for a makeover. But then there are examples like the Bronzeville Winery, um, a $250,000 grant. It opened on the south side, one of the newest dining sensations in Chicago. What's incredible not only is its design, but this curated space that now employs 40 people, 75% who can walk to their place of work. This is with a $250,000 investment by the city to make this happen. And you do the math and realize how many times over this can happen on the corridors. And it goes on. You could do Go Green on Racine, uh, a corner fresh market, or E.G. Wood, um, a collective, of retailers. Uh, Be, Be, uh, Be Love Cafe at the North Lawndale Employment Center. All of these are projects that were supported with resources um, from our Chicago Recovery Plan and 40 Acres. All of these are entrepreneurs who have taken up the call of building the South and West Side. Small. The small, this is when you start to talk about how do you bring the population back? How do you take advantage of the thousands of scattered lots that exist uh, in the neighborhoods? We retooled our entire process and founded Chicago Block Builders. Um, this allows people to go online, see uh, in this case, over 2,000 properties that the city has put up for sale uh, and propose the project that you would like to see and, and purchase it. So the initial applications closed last week. We put up 2,000 plus lots. We received 1,700 applications for those lots and more than half of them are proposing new construction homes on those lots. So this is what it means. This is what it means to build the rooftops to support the commercial corridors, to bring back the vibrancy uh, of these communities. And um, we launched it uh, at the three year anniversary um, in tandem with our Come Home project. And when we mean Come Home, we're talking about people who never left 
and people who want to wel welcome those who they've loved back to the community. This is the missing middle building block of Chicago neighborhoods, the two flats, the three flats, and the other walk-up structures that were demolished during other years. And so with the Chicago Architecture Center, we've kicked off Come Home with a national search for new Chicago typologies that will be constructed by developers like the ones you see in this picture who are buying back the block. And then we will put that together in a pattern book so that those people who buy those lots will have a whole host of design designs that can be made. And we will put the financial incentives together uh, to make that happen. So this is what the missing middle looks like. And we think we can go from this cookie cutter infill that we see throughout Chicago to distinct quality, innovative ways to live in Chicago neighborhoods. So you could take an area that looks like this in Bronzeville and over a course of time, incrementally build back uh, the fabric of those blocks or an area in East Garfield and with two flats, three flats, six flats, build back the fabric of those neighborhoods that, was, that were torn. And we're being very deliberate uh, doing research about who the market is, who wants to come home, uh, who wants to stay, and making sure they all have a place in the future of the West and South Side. So I think, because I heard there were questions, that I probably should stop here. Um, because I could go on to talk about how you render in public policy uh, these images of equity and resiliency that we are now doing in the We Will City Plan um, and the relationship between a healthy heart of the city, our downtown, uh, and the soul of the city, its neighborhoods. But thank you. Thank you for your attention. nice. You don't want to stop him. You know? <laughs> um, thank you, Commissioner. I'll give you a chance to get some water. And um, I do have a question. How many developers, by show of hands, do we have in the room right now? Philip, why isn't your hand up? Oh, okay. I was just checking. I thought, you know, Mr. 43 Green, I wanted to know why your hand wasn't up. Um, that's amazing to see the work that you all are doing, Commissioner, and working in collaboration with all of these folks. Um, you could literally hear a pin drop in here. You all were listening so intently, and believe me, that never happens. There's always a conversation, there's always someone talking, so um, we're gonna get to the questions. Um, I do have one comment. AJ, am I in your book? I just wanna know. Am I in the book when you write it? Okay, I, I'm not gonna embarrass AJ nor myself to tell you how we actually met, but I just wanna be in your book, that's all. Just a little mention, okay? Uh, congratulations to all the developers who are in the room and to all of the work that you have done and to AJ as well. I'm gonna start off with a little softball from Mr. Tim Thomas. I think you're in there, where are you Tim? I know he's here because I saw him, okay. 79th Street Block Club, Auburn Gresham. How much weight is given to community concerns in greenlighting a project? Explain the discontent of the neighbors regarding the Invest Southwest Auburn Gresham project on 79th and the 17th Ward of Chicago. Sure. Um, community engagement, right? Um, in the era of COVID, um, we, I think, did um, hundreds of community meetings in Zoom. Um, which in many ways uh, works for some, but doesn't work for a lot of people. So if you're not technologically savvy, um, you may not have even heard of the project that's happening right down the block. Um, and so, you know, we um, encountered that. 
um, despite um, dozens of meetings, um, we found a lot of people were not ready to see development return to their communities. They had bad experiences, and I think I showed you why they would come to the table with that level of suspicion. But our job was to win their trust and to slow down the process and to think twice uh, about uh, their concerns. And in the case of Auburn Gresham, where a five-story building was proposed with 55 units and retail on the ground floor, you know, we listened to the community and that project became two buildings uh, of 25 or more um, units on two different blocks. So fundamentally, um, we had to adjust to their vision. We could only go at the pace and the rhythm that they could. Now, by the way, they didn't know that by going from one building to two, we just doubled the amount of money it would take to do the project. But we found the resources uh, and Auburn Gresham will have two extraordinary additions uh, in their community. I believe a little birdie told me that um, we, the City Club of Chicago, will be previewing a lot of these properties. So I'm pretty excited. Does that mean I get to have some wine and cheese somewhere, Dan? Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> I can go to some of these places and, is that what you're telling me? I like it. You guys don't like <laughs> the idea to not be, I mean, we'll always, you know, we're going to continue to have the lunches, but the fact that we'll be spanning out and going some other places, that's pretty cool to me. I don't, maybe you guys don't think that, but I do. Um, Tavia Kad Kadikas, am I butchering your name? I totally butchered the name, Tanya Kadakia. Uh, good question. How does, and you know, you came in after a lot of good questions, so I really must like this one. How does DPD plan to get more women developers in the mix? Good question. That's a good question, right? Excellent question. And a few of those women developers are in the house. Um, I've, I've, uh, I've seen a few. Um, I think it has to do with lowering the bar of entry and making, removing the obstacles that remain from people fully participating. Um, and so we have seen um, by changing to a request for qualifications where you simply have to put your qualifications forward, um, a change in the demographic of who's showing up. And in, you know, in the work in uh, Roseland um, that we are evaluating now, there are multiple teams, not only led by women, but all of the members are women. And so I firmly believe that the work we're doing is enabling us to expand the pool. And by shifting our focus to that middle developer and middle density, I think we'll simply create um, more opportunities for more people to be engaged in the work. Okay, lots of good questions. We're gonna go a little bit quicker here because they can only get a few in. Um, some of these questions you will know that, we're, that the commissioner answered during his presentation. So thank you for understanding that in advance. Um, what are the future plans? And this comes from Elizabeth Karv, Karv, Karlov, Karlovics. Are you here, Elizabeth? I butchered your name too, didn't I? My apologies. Um, from Baxter and Woodman. What are the future plans for sustainability for Chicago? What active sustainability, sustainability projects does Chicago have? And how will Chicago be improving access and quality of public transportation, walkability, and bikeability for its residents? Uh, wow, that's a lot. <laughs> um, and the, you know, we're uh, tackling on various levels. I think first and foremost um, is the um, um, connected Communities Ordinance that was passed uh, last year that gives additional uh, value for locating development near transit, for creating pedestrian-oriented places. It also extends for the first time to bus lines, which means that a, a, a bus uh, line, of a uh, high-frequency um, bus line, will have the same privileges uh, as a rail line. 
Uh, so entire areas have all of a sudden become uh, ETOD. That's one way. Um, and we are constantly updating our sustainability goals. Many of the projects uh, that you see there um, are achieving that. We have a passive house apartment building that was shown there. Um, the um, development at Roosevelt and Kosser is gonna be a net zero exporter. So for us, uh, sustainability is in the DNA of the work um, in reusing, recycling, and repurposing um, the resources that we have. That's how you answer a question succinctly. Uh, thank you, I appreciate that. And I'm sure our guests do as well. So I've got a couple of really good ones. I'm gonna go quickly. West Loop Community Organization, Julie Darling, are you here? Hi, Julie. Uh, is there a studying being done for the overall expansion of the West Loop and how can we track the city services to, to coincide with its growth? Hmm. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, I um, didn't really get to uh, the work uh, and the um, West Loop and as it expands, quite frankly, as it accelerates. Um, the good news, I think, is that um, an area like the Fulton Market area is probably one of the most planned neighborhoods in the United States. There are so many plans to address each issue relative to the walkability, relative to transit, relative to the balance between uh, office, retail, and residential. Uh, as, Pete, as many re may remember, um, coming out of COVID and the commercial office market took a hit um, we adjusted our programmatic um, vision uh, and allowed a residential development to have happen north of Lake. So developers were changing their performers and now we are increasing the residential um, mix in that neighborhood. But with that comes a need for services, which is what I think your question responds to um, and creating new tools uh, for how to do that. Um, and so we're very, very mindful that uh, the quality of public space, how do you create more of it um, in the context of the kind of quality of life amenities that people um, expect. Uh, it's an ongoing um, balance that we're trying uh, to set. Uh, so this is a really, thank you. This is a really good question from Kevin Jeff. Are you in the room? Oh, I thought you told me your name was something else. Are you like, do you have like two names or something? What's going on there? Oh, do you know Kevin, sir? I think so. Okay, because I'm like, you're going around with two names. Huh? You know. Um, Kevin is from Deeply Rooted Productions Dance Theater and a very nice gentleman. I'm excited about your cultural plans for the city. Since culture and arts play a major role in Chicago's economic and social development, please share your thoughts and hopes and dreams for the city with respect to arts. Yeah, no, this is uh, a big one. And I, uh, my partner in crime and uh, all things kind of culture and the arts, um, Commissioner Harkey, uh, we work very, very close together uh, and try to thread the arts um, through everything we do, whether it's a streetscape or whether it's a construction fence around a property, um, whether it's creating new public spaces um, for people to gather and have performance, uh, and then um, valuing some of those amazing um, cultural institutions uh, that are, are there uh, and uh, bringing those uh, to the corridors. So, um, we, we, we tracked uh, new projects like Deeply Rooted, uh, and our hope is that it will be one of those new cultural institutions uh, that we can be proud to have on the South Side, for sure. Now, Laurent, this is a softball, since you all thought I wasn't giving him hard questions over there. Charlie Bushberger from Smith Group, are you here? Oh, good, I'm glad you're here. These are two great questions. I'm gonna combine them. What's at the top of your wish list and what are your two biggest challenges that you see in the forecast? And those are the last two. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the top of my wish list um, is four more years to do this work. 
<laughs> okay. Um, and uh, of course, you know, uh, the challenge, uh, the challenge is I think we are in the midst of a transformation before our very eyes. And I think those of you who do this work every day know that it's happening um, and are excited um, by it. Um, our job is how do we communicate that to everyone in Chicago? How do we get them on board? How do we start to see the north side as being tied to the west side and the south side, that the interests of the south and west side that's the interests of the North and the Central. So it's, it's, it's really, really challenging to get to this place where um, we all feel like this is one Chicago. I think that's our greatest challenge, but I am so psyched uh, to continue to work uh, to make that happen. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're not quite done yet. Thank you all so much. Um, where are you going, Commissioner? We're not done yet. Summation. He was like, I'm done, right? Uh, so many good questions. And so, like I said, several of the questions were already asked during the answered during the presentation. So um, it was not ignoring your question, just did not want to be redundant. Uh, let's see. Laurent, since I was giving you a hard time over there, that table was cutting up. Amanda's going to ask you to pull. Uh oh. <laughs> okay, let's see. Today's recipient of the Alpena Sings Restaurant gift card. You guys know who Alpena Sing is, right? I was waiting for the big ooh. <laughs> is, drum roll, Julie Darling. That's what happens when you ask a good questions, right? Um, Commissioner, although I feel like you should have a couple of these, he and I did talk earlier and um, we've been trying to get him since, I think right when the pandemic started, so what's that? What are we in year, what are we, year three now? I can't, two, three, five, seven, I don't know. Um, this is your one year subscription and prescription and um, membership, and we hope that you use it. Absolutely. And um, you seem like we should have like several of those because you should have been here. This was definitely a dream deferred, as he said. We've been wanting to have the commissioner for quite some time. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, this is certainly due to a part two, wouldn't you say? We need to hear more from him. I know that he cut his presentation short. We're trying to get this timing thing down. We're working on it really, really hard. So thank you to all the de developers in the room. I know that you all wanna to speak to the commissioner, so we are gonna adjourn, but we're gonna do one quick pickup here and then I have a feeling this line's gonna get kinda of long. So. so where are you going? He's leaving again. <laughs> I'm going to start taking this personally in just a second. Um, thank you so much. We are adjourned and we'll wait for the photographer. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>